Good afternoon. Welcome to God's house this afternoon as we observe sanctity of life. As we do so, our theme for the service is to value the gift. The order of service that will follow is the order of service of word and sacrament. As we begin our worship today, let us join in singing our first hymn, which is hymn 339, Today Your Mercy Calls Us. stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am and I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given us his one and only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, 
Hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your one and only Son to be the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be made known, worshipped, and believed to the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. may be seated. Our first lesson today is taken from Jonah chapter 4. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city, there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort, and Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose... God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you have any right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people 
who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? The word of the Lord. We continue with our psalm of the day, Psalm 139b. Our second lesson is taken from 1 John chapter 3. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know that what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Alleluia.
please stand for the reading of our gospel. The gospel lesson appointed for our Sanctity of Life Sunday is taken from John chapter 15. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you my friends. For everything that I, have, I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated as we join to sing our hymn of the day, which is hymn 343, Christ is the World's Light. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our special consideration this afternoon is one verse from our gospel for the day. John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. 
This is the gospel of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, how do you know the value of something? If you're in business, you may simply say that that something is worth whatever someone is willing to pay for it. If you're an economist, you might talk about how the the law of supply and demand determines the cost of a particular good, but you'll probably also admit that value and cost aren't exactly the same thing. The question of value gets trickier when we get to matters of taste, context, and and personal preference. A three-year-old's favorite teddy bear may be the most valuable thing in the world to him, even if someone else thinks it would be ready to throw in the trash. And a billionaire might bid $300 million at auction for a painting that you and I would probably not be willing to spend 300 for. And I imagine that a Green Bay Packers jersey signed by Aaron Rodgers won't be worth half as much in Dallas, Phoenix, or Tampa Bay as it would be here. But all of those are things. What about people? How do you know the value of a human being? What is a person's life worth? Now, our first impulse in answering that might be to do so in a a general way, and, and to do that, we would measure other people. But what if it were your own life? Imagine yourself in another time or another place standing on the block at a slave auction, hearing various people out there in the crowd bidding to buy you placing a value on your strength, your talents, your looks, your skills, your body and life, would you ever feel that that their price was high enough to match what you feel you are worth? Or imagine a situation that someone in our society is, is perhaps more likely to face in this day and age. You are diagnosed with a rare type of cancer. It's aggressive. And the doctor tells you that if it is not treated, you will probably be dead in six months. The good news, there is a new treatment available that has a 70% success rate with this type of cancer. The bad news, it's extremely expensive. As much as $600,000 for a three-month course of the medicine. So how much is your life worth then? All depends on who's paying, right? If it's the government, they will set a limit. If it's your health insurance company, they will have a different figure. And if you're paying out of pocket, well, your family and perhaps especially your heirs, might put a completely different value on your life. And who's to say that any of them would see it the same way you do? Now, this isn't just a a mental exercise. There are real-life stories from places where assisted suicide is legal, where someone with advanced cancer has been told expensive treatments would not be covered but suicide pills would be. Now imagine one more situation. You are a brand new human being, just a few weeks or months old, growing in your mother's womb. Your entire existence is about growing, growing bigger, stronger, smarter, so that you can enter the world of of, of air and light and, and, and fulfill the many, many wonderful purposes that God has in mind for you. But the mother, whose arms you are made for and, and with whom you already have such a unique bond, is conflicted. 
on the one hand, there is your life. But on the other hand, is her just beginning to blossom career, which she is certain will be stalled or or at least significantly sidetracked if she has a baby right now. How much will you end up being worth to her? Now, of course, we are all inclined naturally to care more about our own lives and value them more highly than others. But as Christians, we particularly appreciate that the worth that we give ourselves should also be given to every other person because every other person is a living special, unique creation of God, just as we are. And actually, it's even more than that. As in in Philippians 2, Paul tells us, in humility, consider others better than yourselves. But that still doesn't answer the fundamental question. What is any person's life worth? This gift, which is what life is, because it is not something that any of us could ever make or earn or purchase. This gift of life, how should it be valued? The Bible gives us the answer. It tells us exactly the value that God has placed on every life. But at the same time, It tells us that it is a price far beyond dollars and cents, beyond measuring, beyond figuring out. We heard it just a few minutes ago in our reading from 1 John 3. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Now, on the first level, that that verse is, is obviously telling us something about love. But in doing that, it also states something about how the Lord, in love, values us. For your life, and for my life, and for every sinner's life, Jesus gave His life. And that is hardly a one-for-one, like-for-like transaction. The life that Jesus gave and the death he died, was fully human. But it was in a class all alone, because he was not just a man, but was the very Son of God, begotten by the Father from all eternity, co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Word of God incarnate, the Lord of the universe. This is one of the the logic-defying, love-defining truths of the gospel that should blow our minds every day. Not just that God chose to save us instead of punishing us as we deserve for every one of our sins, but that each one of us was worth so much that the Son of God submitted Himself to unearned suffering unimaginable pain and the ultimate inconceivable price he died the righteous for the unrighteous the the all-powerful for the powerless the eternal for the created the immortal for the mortal we treasure this truth Not just because it is so amazing and wonderful, but especially because this truth is for us. And we need it to be for us. Because without it, we would be lost and hopeless. We are sinners who sin. Every one of us. From the moment we come into existence in our mother's wombs, we bear the stain of sin, and and from the time we meet the world, sin becomes part of our daily, even hourly practice. As children, 
We, we fail to value our, our parents as God's representatives and, and blessings to us, and so we disobey them. And when we grow up and marry, we fail to value our spouses as God's special gifts. And so we snipe and grow resentful. We, we criticize and quarrel. We cheat or, or flirt with unfaithfulness or we, we just give up in our callings as, as friends, as neighbors, as, as siblings, as citizens, and in whatever jobs it is we have. We fail to value the people that God has placed in our lives for us to love and to serve. And even as Christians, we too often fail to value God's name God's gifts and and God's means of grace, the the gospel and the word and and in the sacraments. I I could list plenty of other sins that I am guilty of and that that you are guilty of, but, but the point is clear. Because we are disobedient and and ungrateful rebels against our Creator and His will, what we deserve from Him is not salvation, but damnation. Not heaven, but hell. But despite this, the Father said, no. No. I love them. Each one and all of them. I will save them so that they can be with me forever. So he made a plan. And He sent His Son, and and Jesus took on our sins and suffered for them and, and died for them on the cross, paying the price of our disobedience and ingratitude in full. He exchanged our guilt for His perfect holiness so that now we are qualified for the life that God created us for, and paradise awaits us. It makes no earthly sense but heaven's considerations are higher than ours. Christ decided that you were worth sacrificing His life for. And because of that, you have been set free from sin and and will live forever, just as He does since His Easter morning resurrection. And so, if God valued you enough to give you life, and even more than that, valued you enough to give His Son for your salvation, then clearly your life has tremendous, amazing value. When Jesus told His disciples that there is no greater way to show your love for someone than to lay down your life for that someone, He was talking about the the highest price anyone could ever pay. You you could have $10 in your wallet or or billions in your bank account, but still the greatest gift of love you can give is your own life for your friend or your spouse or child or brother or, or sister or neighbor. Again, that doesn't just say something about love. It says something about the value of your life. And so what should be true of all people will be especially true of Christians. We will recognize the value of our own lives. We will treasure that gift and and, and therefore take good care of it and treat it as something of of great worth. Now, it, it is not unusual to hear unbelievers speak of life as a gift to be appreciated or, or celebrated. You don't have to be a Christian to experience the joys of, of, of watching children grow, grow of, of, of love and laughter, of, of a summer breeze or a brilliant sunset, of, of good food and refreshing water, or the thrills of, of, of curiosity, a, a, achievement, and, and discovery. But there's a problem when people use those experiences to measure the value of their lives. Because when age or illness, disability or or even depression keeps them from enjoying what they used to enjoy, they begin to think that their lives aren't worth much anymore. 
And then maybe come things like, I don't know, no longer taking care of your health or, or acting without care or being reckless. But it can also lead to, to bigger things like considering suicide or more and more today, asking doctors or others to help you take your life. Let's be clear. Devaluing your life in any of those or other ways is sinful. It is not up to anyone but God to decide when your life should no longer be lived. And until that day and hour, we have the responsibility to be good stewards of the gift of life, to take good care of our physical and mental health as, as well as our spiritual needs. What that requires is going to be different for different people and at different times, but as God's dearly loved children, we will always value His precious gift of life. And not just for ourselves. You might remember how Luther explains the fifth commandment in the small catechism. We should fear and love God that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and befriend him in every bodily need. One might say that the bare minimum of loving our brothers and sisters and neighbors as Jesus has loved us is not causing them pain not endangering their life or health. But love is never about the minimum. So we will value the gift of life in and for those who cannot or will not do so themselves. The Bible is full of encouragements and commands to take care of the vulnerable in society, widows and orphans being perhaps the most common example, But we are also told in Proverbs 31 to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. And there are probably no people who fit that description better than the unborn. In God's eyes, and therefore also in our eyes, the life of a a two-week-old fetus in the womb the life of a a two-minute-old embryo in a a Petri dish, and the life of a two-month-old squalling baby have great value. Not just some value, but the same value as any other human being. Because that is what they are. Body and soul, human beings, unique, living, and loved by God. So as Christians, we certainly cannot condone or participate in abortion. And embryos outside the womb must be respected and and treated as, as special and precious human beings. So we will reject scientific experimentation with them and reckless fertility treatments. Speaking up for these tiny people can take many forms, and and in the coming months, changes in American abortion law may may give us new opportunities and, and obligations to speak. But the one thing we cannot do when we value the gift of life is sit silent and ignore the injustice and horror going on all around us. Increasingly also, we find ourselves needing to pay attention to things happening at the end of life as much as at the beginning. In the name of compassion, though it's often more about finances or or the preferences of family members, patients with terminal conditions are, are being helped along to death, often long before it is clear that God is, is ready to take them. The elderly Severely ill and handicapped are are being pressured to give up on living so that their dying can make life easier for other people. And people with with dementia are routinely treated as, as less than the human beings that they are as though their condition has has lowered or even eroded entirely their the value of their lives. 
and when, or because they cannot speak for themselves, Christ's disciples will speak up for them. But talk can be, as they say, cheap. You know, what my organization, Christian Life Resources, and caring believers are about is, is a lot more than, than just abortion or, or euthanasia. When we value the gift of life, and when we love our neighbor, we will act, and not only in small or unseen ways. If Jesus tells us that the kind of love that we will aim for is the kind that lays down our lives for others, then things that are less and less final than dying for someone will be common practice for us, right? For instance, instead of condemning a single mother, we will help her to care for her child and to be a good parent. This is the, the basic purpose of, of New Beginnings, CLR's home for mothers in Milwaukee, and, and increasingly what our, our pregnancy centers, like the um, Alpha Resource Center in Watertown, are, are working at. Or instead of just feeling sorry for the disabled, we will try to give them the support and assistance they need. And instead of ignoring the elderly, especially those in poverty, we will find ways to honor and care for them. Every day, we are given opportunities to show the love of Jesus by valuing others' lives more highly than our own and giving of ourselves as He gave Himself for us, His friends. In our first lesson today, we read how God used a simple vine to teach Jonah a lesson about valuing life. The prophet claimed his own life wasn't worth living. He said he'd rather die than live. But in fact, he was only upset and uncomfortable. And when the vine grew up and gave him shade, he was happy. The death of the vine made him angry. He was emotionally invested in its life. And God used that to make his point. The thousands and thousands of people in Nineveh that Jonah wanted to see destroyed because they were Israel's enemies, they were all souls that mattered to God. He was emotionally invested in their lives. And those lives should have mattered to his prophet, too. You and I do not need a vine and a scorching east wind to learn this lesson. We have the sacrifice and example of Jesus who gave himself for us. The love of God which has given us life is our guide, our power, and our inspiration. Whenever, wherever, and in whomever we encounter human life, our actions, our attitudes and our words will show the wonder and the worth of it. Love as we have been loved. Value the gift. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us join together in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God and God, God and God, light and light, true God and true God, we God.
Please join with me in the responsive prayer that you can see up on the screen. In our special prayers, we keep David Mack in our prayers, who is struggling in his health. We also pray for the voters this upcoming Sunday, who will be offering out and, and calling our new principal, as well as a number of other calls, so that our school will be fully staffed next year. And so let us go to the Lord in prayer. For every unborn child, and for his or her mother and father, that God might teach us how to love and support them. Hear our prayer, O Lord. For women and men whose hearts are weighed down by the sin of abortion, that you, O merciful Lord, might bring them peace. Hear our prayer, O Lord. For all medical researchers, that God might give them the grace to use their talents and skills to preserve and protect all human life from conception, to natural death. For legislatures, that they may preserve the right of each of us to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For a growing love for the weak and vulnerable, that in the model of Christ Jesus our Lord, we might work to sustain and protect the lives of all who are in need. And Lord God, we ask that you would hear our prayers for David Mack, who is ill and is struggling in this life. We ask that you would grant him healing and relief according to your good and gracious will. May the doctors and the nurses and all the treatments that they may use be blessed by you. We commend him into your care. We also, dear Lord, ask for your blessing upon the voters' meeting this upcoming Sunday. We ask that you would give us wisdom and bless the decisions made by this voting assembly that we may call forth workers for this field of service here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church and School. We ask that all these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And now hear us, dear Lord, as we pray the prayer Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In the past he spoke to us through the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, who is the radiance of his glory. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
The Lord's Supper is prepared. I invite those who are confirmed members of a Wells or ELS church body to come forward and partake of this blessing. This evening, we will partake of the Lord's Supper by tables. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace.
Good afternoon to one and all. Special welcome to our guests with us and also a special welcome to our guest preacher and many thanks. Thank you so much, Pastor Samuelson. As we gather today, we do have news in regards to the calls that we have been administering and this is from Pastor Mark Cars. He writes, Dear brothers and sisters of St. Paul's, greetings in the name of our risen and ascended Savior, Jesus Christ. This letter is to inform you of my decision regarding the divine call which the Holy Spirit led you to extend to me. As I have wrestled in prayer over the opportunities before me, the Lord has led me to return the call which you have extended to me. At this time, I feel my gifts and abilities would be best used to continue with the opportunities for ministry here at Calvary and St. John's. I do not say this lightly, that I very much appreciated my conversations with Pastor Vic and the other leaders of your congregation. After speaking with them, it is clear that the Lord certainly is doing some wonderful things in your congregation. It seems the plans are in place to continue to grow in the areas of youth ministry and outreach, and I am confident the Lord will provide the right shepherd to help guide you in those areas. I would also like to say that I am very grateful for your prayers and input as I deliberated this call. Please know that I and our congregations will continue to keep you in our prayers as you wait for the loving leader whom the Lord will provide for you. As you continue the calling process, may you trust in Jesus, who is the head of the church. May the Lord continue to bless your congregation in the future as he has in the past. In Christ's service, Pastor Mark Cars. So with Pastor Cars returning our call, we are going to actually add our pastoral call to our annual meeting on January 30th. And so January 30th is going to be a fun day. Both we will administer a call as well as go over the annual reports of our church body and see where we have been and also chart a course where we will go in the upcoming year. A number of other announcements that you can see up on the screen. If you would like to join us at about 9.15 this coming Sunday, that is when we will see a presentation given to us by our guest preacher, Pastor Samuelson, as he will present on Christian Life Resources. And so we'll have that opportunity on Sunday. Otherwise, next Sunday will be our Lutheran, uh, Lakeside Lutheran High School Sunday. And so please look forward to that as we'll have the choir as well as all sorts of music as well as another guest preacher. So God's blessings to all of you. Until we meet again, the Lord be with you all. Mm -hmm.